Peloponnese is the southernmost part of the Balkan Peninsula. It is blessed with stunning landscapes, a rich natural history, and some of the most impressive and important historical sites in Greece. It's a wonderful and welcoming area to travel around at almost any time of the year, but for this talk we'll focus on October in the early autumn. Many plants retreat underground in the lower altitudes in order to protect themselves from desiccation in the heat of the summer. Underground storage or, or organs can get them off to an early start when some rain and cooler weather comes in the autumn. Strictly, these are referred to as bulbous geophytes or more informally as bulbs, although the storage organs could be bulbs, corms or tubers. This talk will provide an introduction to the autumn flowering bulbs of the Peloponnese. Let's get the maps out of the way quickly. As you're probably aware, the Peloponnese is almost completely separated from the rest of the Greek mainland by the Gulf of Corinth. We'll cross into the Peloponnese on the west side of the Gulf at its narrowest point, so I'm a little cavalier about naming the talk, as we will include some of the sites on the north of the Gulf of Corinth. Delphi and Parnassus are easily accessible. Uh, further west, the route passes through some wonderful broadleaf woodland before an overnight stop at Nafpactus, then across into the Peloponnese and the ancient site of the Olympic Games, which, although heavily visited, still has a strong natural history interest. Travelling southeast from Olympia takes us through some less touristy and stunning scenery of Arcadia before moving down to the Taigetus mountain. From there, we'll move on down to the Marni Peninsula. Um, after that, we'll move across to the island of Monavasia and the easternmost peninsula of the Peloponnese. So let's start at Delphi on the lower slopes of Mount Parnassus. The Temple of Apollo dates from the 4th century BC and offers commanding views over the surrounding valleys that lead down to the Gulf of Corinth. And to the bulbs at last. When it comes to autumn bulbs, perhaps autumn crocus which is of course a colchicum, is one of the most familiar horticulturally. We do see true autumn flowering crocuses in the gardens, uh, in our gardens, but uh, our first bulb here in Delphi is Stern uh, Sternbergia, Sternbergia lutea. Amongst its common names is autumn daffodil, and this is indeed more accurate than the aforementioned denomination autumn crocus. Sternbergia is in the Amaryllid daisy family, the same as Narcissus. Uh, if you look closely, the ovary is inferior, like that of a Narcissus, and all but one of the eight accepted species of Sternbergia have a yellow corolla. The exception is the white-flowered and appropriate name Sternbergia candida from Turkey, north, uh, southwest Turkey. Sternbergia is named after the bohemian botanist and explorer Caspar Maria von Sternberg, um, the naming taking, um, being in 1804. Um, and as we'll see later, there's some discussion about the precise delineation of species, which uh, one suspects will continue. We should move on from this most scenic of ancient sites and explore a little further into the Parnassus National Park. This will introduce us to two more genera with goblet-shaped flowers to get these covered. Uh, Parnassus is not the most dramatic mountain, but the massive does cover an extensive area with a very rich and diverse natural history. There are a good number of crocuses, for example, more or less where I was standing to take this picture. I remember that at one of the first lectures I attended, of my then AGS local group, Brian Matthew introduced us to the identification of crocuses by telling us how important the tunic of the corms was in distinguishing between different species. Uh, this is not so helpful in the field, but using some straightforward features and a current understanding of the distributions, the peaking at tunics can be left to the specialists. Some basics first. Uh, crocuses are in the Iridaceae family, so have three stamens in contrast to the six of Sternbergia. This is Crocus hadriaticus, a native to Greece, uh, but with some discussion ongoing about subspecies. The flowers are white, but the colour of the throat is variable. Those on Parnassus typically have a white throat, 
<clears throat> although sometimes with a hint of purple. These are ascribed to subspecies Parnassicus, although with some debate about the subspecies status. You can see the three stamens clearly here. Uh, the variations in the styles across species are also interesting to see and can be a, a very helpful diagnostic. It's perhaps also worth mentioning at this point that crocus and all bar one species of Iridaceae have an inferior ovary like Sternbergia. However, in a crocus it lies just above the corm and below the long perianth tube and so spends most of its life underground and hidden. Crocus cancellatus is distinguished by the many branch style, significantly uh, exceeding the length of the anthers. The flower colour can vary from white through the shaded lilac of this plant to a more rich bluish lilac. The stripes, white on lilac or light lilac on white depending on the relative balance, yield the, the most attractive of plants. Uh, the specific name cancellatus uh, refers to the latticing on the corm's tunics which distinguishes it from uh, Crocus matthewi. Uh, but here on the Peloponnese, uh, the only choice really is Crocus cancellatus and indeed subspecies Metziaricus. So there's absolutely no need to be tempted to sneak a peak underground. So just to recap, Sternbergias, six stamens and a clearly visible inferior ovary, Crocus with three stamens and also an inferior ovary but one that is normally underground until seed set. Then we have Colchicums, Six stamens again, but this time in contrast to Sternbergias, the ovary is superior. However, although the perianth tube joins below the ovary, this join is just above the corm and so normally below ground or just raised above ground on a short pedicel. As a result, despite the sharing of six stamens, colchicums are easy to distinguish from Sternbergias as the perianth tube of the former extends to or near to the ground. In truth, it's hard to confuse the two genera. Uh, this one is Colchicum boissieri. All the ones we'll see are more crocus sized and not as bold as those normally grown in gardens, but they do make an attractive display in a small pan or trough. Note the white filamentous style curving over to the left and significantly longer than the stamens. They are, of course, attractive to pollinators, making feasting butterflies somewhat oblivious to curious cameras. With its purplish-black anthers, Colchicum cupani is a delightful and easily distinguished little plant. Note the white filaments and the white styles that are longer than the anthers. In addition, the leaves are often partially developed at flowering time. It is also a delight in a pan or a trough, although if you use the latter, make sure to give it space for the leaves to develop. Although they're not as thuggish as those of the large flowered colchicums, they are still significantly bolder than those of a crocus. Moving a little higher as evening begins to shadow, the draw of the high reaches of Parnassus is strong, but we'll have to wait for another time. However, there's still more to see at this altitude though, uh, with a third colchicum, Colchicum grecum. You can't see it clearly in this photograph, unfortunately, but the white styles overtop the stamens and are curved at the tips. The medium white stripes on the tepals can be more or less distinct in some variation between the flowers. Heading back down and looping around to the town of Amphisa, we see a little bit of variation in the Sternbergias. Sternbergia Sicula is a smaller plant than Lutea with, a narrower, with narrower leaves. However, as so often, it's not clear that this is sufficient to justify species status as the characters may fall within the natural range of variation of Sternbergia lutea. Q's Plant of the World Online <coughs> gives it subspecies status, but other authorities simply include it in subspecies lutea. At the moment, uh, we can just wait for the debate to pan out. The smaller roads from Amphisa to Napactus pass through some amazing mixed deciduous woodland. Herein lies one of the largest of the Greek crocuses, Crocus robertianus. 
the colouring of its large lilac blue tinted flowers is very subtle and makes it one of the most beautiful of crocuses as a specimen plant. This specific plant is at the lighter and whiter end of a spectrum that ranges to a much stronger lilac blue. The orange stigma reaches above the stamens and almost above the tepals. Uh, this species was first collected in 1967 by J. L. Marr and the name commemorates his son who sadly died in, in childhood. It is found in occasional colonies throughout the Pindus Mountains north of here on woodland edges of oak or beech forest. Uh, studies from some recent collections are suggesting that the plants in damp woodland near the Gulf of Corinth as here may be a distinct and as yet unnamed species but I believe that is work in progress. Now we really should be he heading off to the Peloponnese proper. The beautiful Venetian port of Navpactus is close to the narrowing of the Gulf of Corinth at its western end. Rather unromantically, the name Navpactus is derived from ancient Greek that simply means boatyard. Legend has it that it was here that the Heraclidae built a fleet to invade the Peloponnese, but now you can simply drive over a bridge on, on down to Olympia. Known worldwide as the original home of the Olympic Games, it is now firmly on the cruise ship map with busloads of visitors who are not terribly interested in the plants that can be found here. Scylla, Scylla autumnalis is fortunately out of exercise range for most of the crowds. Crocus borei can be found around the edge of the stadium in the, the grass. Uh, hopefully safe, more or less safe from footsteps, is named after Jean-Baptiste Borry de Saint-Vincent, who was not only a naturalist of some distinction, but also a military officer and politician who managed to wiggle his way through the turbulent times of Napoleonic France. Fortunately, they didn't try to squeeze his full name into the specific epithet there are some strong above-ground similarities uh, with Crocus levigatus that we'll see later, uh, notably with regards to the white flowers and, and distinctive white anthers, but Crocus borei holds uh, its rather distinctive goblet shape even in bright sunlight, and the corolla is a pure white apart from the yellow base. Travelling more or less southerly but across country from Olympia takes one through some fine maquis and uh, through Arcadia to some prime temperate forest. Arbutus and Drachne here in the foreground and Paras spinosa are characteristic shrubs or small trees of this maquis with Erica manipuliflora as a strongly ascending and spreading member of its typically bio, uh, calcifuge biome. Open grassland patches provide a refuge for bulbous geophytes. I think Crocus hadriaticus will be subject to further studies for quite a while. Generally, the forms away from Parnassus with yellow throats are ascribed to subspecies hadriaticus, um, but all these differences seem highly variable, and one wonders a bit if plants know they should commit to the rules we impose on them. The Crocus biflorus complex is a case in point. Uh, generally, they are spring flowering and give much joy then. Clearly distinguished by the strong feathering on the outside of the tepals is Crocus melanthorus. This has previously been grouped in the biflorus complex uh, as Crocus biflorus subspecies melanthorus, uh, but it distinguishes itself from that complex uh, of often very garden worthy spring flowering crocuses by being autumn flowering. Q's Plant of the World Online follows Yanis Ruxans in accepting Melanthrus as a species, and this seems highly credible. So let's call it Crocus Melanthrus and hope it accepts this denomination. Further south, then we reach the Taigetus Mountains. Black pine, Pinus nigra, and Greek fir, Abies cephalonica, dominate the slopes below the tree line, but at lower level are stands of old growth old growth Platinus orientalis woodland. Damp gullies are good to explore here in the hope of finding autumn flowering snowdrop, Galanthus regini olgai. The prominent, prominent inferior ovary suggests correctly that it is also in the Amaryllidaceae family along with Sternbergia. 
Apart from the autumn flowering, it is very similar to the more familiar Gananthus nivalis, of course, but the leaves, when they appear, have a silvery grey stripe down the centre in contrast to the uniform coloured leaves of Galanthus nivalis. In case you were wondering, uh, the specific name translates as Queen Olga, uh, Olga Konstantinovna of Russia, who as wife of King George I was Queen of Greece when the plant was first described in 1876. Climbing up beyond the broadleaf woodland takes one out into sparser pine and abios forest with a maquis-like vegetation, including Juniperus, uh, Juniperus oxycedrus uh, in the more open spots. This is quite a harsh, sun-baked terrain, but even so there are grass clearings with more autumn bulbs coming through as soon as the temperatures fall uh, a little with some rain. Here we have Colchicum pulchellum. Uh, there have been some recordings of Colchicum lingulatum from the Peloponnese. However, the latter slender white styles, although sometimes with faint tessellations, which uh, Colchicum pulchellum does not have. There are other differences, but there is no need to uproot the corn to see these if you're in the Tegetus Mountains, as the evidence to date is that this plant at this altitude, or all the plants at this altitude, are pulchellum. Representing another family is uh, perhaps misplaced sea squill. It's quite a distance from the sea here. These are in the Asparagaceae and may be known to you as Erginia maritima, but life underground gets complex again. First, the generic name is now Drimia, uh, following the abolition of the genus Erginia in 2004 through no fault of its own when it was absorbed into the genus Drimia. Then we have the problems with the bulbs. Drimia maritima has large greenish bulbs with a red tunic. Drimia numidica has pink bulbs but seems otherwise indistinguishable in the field. However, this is the one that is found in the central and east central Mediterranean area and so avoiding the use of a botanical shovel we will assign this plant to Drimia numidica. As always, why pink here and green there we may ask. Fortunes were spent on CERN to find Higgs bosons, but these simple botanical questions remain unanswered. Travelling down to the eastern side of the Taigetus Mountains takes us to the picturesque port of Githian at the start of the Marni Peninsula. This was the ancient seaport of Sparta, uh, but it has a much quieter role now. The island of Cranai is now linked to Githian by a short causeway, and also links Githian to Greek mythology, as it is claimed to be where Helen and Paris spent their first night before heading onwards to Troy. As this hails from mythology, there are other locations that could justifiably be uh, make a similar claim, uh, but it does indicate a long history of its being seen as a special place of natural beauty, and there is good reason for this. The island has some of the best colonies of Cyclum and Grecum that one could hope to find. They scatter hither and thither across the island, mostly nestling in and amongst rocks in full sun. In some cases they are quite embedded in the rock itself. The flower colour varies from pale pink, almost white, down to quite deep pink. Uh, we'll see some of the striking colour forms of these later. Uh, for the moment, note for future reference that the purple basal blotch extends fairly uniformly along the veins. For many, it is the variation, though, of the leaf uh, form that arouses a passionate interest, with each plant seemingly unique. Undeniably, this is a very special place indeed. Still, cyclamen are not the only fruit, sorry, flowers, and there is more to see under the tree cover. Crocus borei is here and enjoys the more open rocky spots, although tolerating some shade. As mentioned earlier, it holds its goblet shape in bright sun. In addition, the white anthers and heavily divided style make it a plant of, of great character. Some plants in certain populations have a tint of lilac in the flowers and the throat varies in the intensity of yellow. Not surprisingly, it needs to be kept warm and dry in the summer. 
although reputed to be reasonably easy, uh, the corms are expensive and so it's perhaps safest to keep them in pots that can be kept free of too much cold and wet in the winter. Over on the west side of the Marne Peninsula are the type locations of two particularly special crocuses. The coastal regions to the north and to the south of Areopolis are a treasure house. Groves of autumn daffodils, uh, Stambogia lutea of course, lead one to orchards where Crocus gulimii grows in dappled shade. This was first discovered in 1954 by the distinguished lawyer and equally distinguished amateur, bot amateur botanist Dr. Konstantin Golimi, uh, with the type location being on the west coast of the Marni near Areopolis. It is perhaps one of the most beautiful of the crocuses, crocuses especially en masse with its lavender blue flowers. Sadly, these pictures suffer a little from the combination of codochrome and bright sunlight, uh, but at least they show the elegant shape of the flower and the attractively divided style. It is restricted to the southern Peloponnese, uh, which is perhaps the reason for its relatively late discovery, but I've found it to be quite hardy in the south of England, at least. Um, this more recent digital photograph captures the colour more accurately, I think. Um, the colour is variable, although most plants on the western side of the Peloponnese shade around this level of lavender blue. A famous exception is the pure white selection Marni White, but uh, we'll need to revisit the variability of crocus as we travel further east. Cyclamen grecum is forever a distraction. For sure you'll be stopped in your tracks on a regular basis by a new stunning colour form. In true Oscar Wilde fashion, never resist temptation. Uh, never resist the temptation to stop and admire no matter how many different shades you see. However, it's all also important to give time to some of the more modest plants. This little highly scented autumn flowering daffodil has been attributed to Narcissus serotinus. However, it seems that Narcissus serotinus is restricted to the western Mediterranean, namely the Iberian Peninsula and West Morocco, with Narcissus obsoletus being the plant of the eastern Mediterranean. The colour of its vestigial cup is quite variable, but it is more or less entire in contrast to that of Narcissus serotinus, which is consistently bright yellow and divided. I mentioned two special crocuses of the Marni. The second is Crocus nivius, although I believe strictly the type hailed from the plants grown by E.A. Bowles uh, back in the UK in 1900. It is one of the largest flowered of any of the wild crocuses and seems to be quite easy to grow in the garden. Hence, it's much more widely available uh, in nurseries than Crocus gulemii. The specific name is a fallback to the plants from a Dutch nursery in 1900 being pure white. However, like blue shades are not uncommon in the wild and in nurseries, it's still a bit of a puzzle why Crocus gulemii was discovered so much later than Crocus nivius. Uh, although the latter is perhaps a little more widespread through the Peloponnese and certainly draws attention to itself wherever it does grow, as it can make very large and dense colonies. I haven't yet said anything about Cyclamen hedrifolium. Although it's widespread throughout Greece, southern Greece does have an accepted subspecies of its own, uh, subspecies Crassifolium. As its name suggests, this subspecies has thicker, fleshier leaves than the nominate species, with the flowers perhaps being stronger, although further studies on the differences in distribution of subspecies Crassifolium do seem to be needed. Um, it does have, however, double the chromosome count of subspecies Hedrifolium, but this doesn't really help in terms of identifying plants in the field. Let's follow Crocus gulimii over towards the eastern peninsula of the Peloponnese. Up in the hills, just past the town of Sicia, there is a second population of interest. It is very abundant on field margins and into open woodland in some places, and although, again, Codochrome does not make for good comparisons, these are all of a lighter shade than the plants on the Marni. 
Flower colour is not a good character with which to differentiate within species, and so this is merely to make an observation. But there is perhaps something going on here that is worthy of further study over time. We'll come back to that. We'll see more variability if we head on toward Monambasia. The town of Monambasia is on the seaward side of an island that is tied to the mainland via a tombola, uh, which is a naturally formed spit of sand and shingle. Formerly known throughout Europe as a trading point for Malvasia wine, many of the houses have now been restored for use as hotels uh, of great character whose rooms are, of course, in high demand. The top of the island has both archaeological and botanical interest, but let's travel a little further south along the coast. It's here that we find a third colour form of Crocus golemii, one that is clearly distinct. Brian Matthew recognised this as subspecies Leucanthus. Uh, it is differentiated from the selected form Marnie White and is found on this uh, eastern peninsula south of Monimbasia in some abundance and with some variation. These plants are pure white but there are shades of lavender in other colonies and some of the nursery plays raised plants sold as subspecies Leucanthus do also show this, this variation. Consequently, at the moment, opinion is divided as to whether the identification of any infraspecifics is appropriate. Hughes' Plants of the World Online doesn't do so, for example, but I'm inclined to add that what we see in our lives is but a snapshot of long-term change, so it would be interesting to be a time traveller and see how the state of, of these three colour forms of Crocus gulimii pans out over time. Hopefully they will survive and continue to evolve even if the human race bombs out as a dysfunctional dead end. Back to the Peloponnese. The white-flowered Gulimii is of local interest, but there are good numbers of more widespread species too. Cyclamen hedrifolium, subspecies hedrifolium, must get a mention as it is a fine plant and a valuable addition to woodland or slightly shaded parts of the garden. It provides pink highlights in this otherwise sea of white flowers. These in turn, the white flowers, in turn, need a closer look, as they're not all Crocus gulimii. Notice the white anthers, but in turn the corolla is not as pure white as Crocus borei, which we've seen before. There are hints of purple striping here, although the amount is quite variable. Uh, this characterises these plants as Crocus levigatus. Mixed populations of levigatus and borei can be found, uh, although this site seemed to only have Crocus levigatus. The specific name refers to the smooth tunic of the corm, where, which is very hard. Um, the two species, Borei and Levigatus, can be hard to distinguish for plants in their respective boundaries of their natural variability, um, but this specific plant doesn't seem to offer any challenges, though the, the purple feathering is, is quite strong on this one. So there we have it, a rapid tour of the Peloponnese to provide an introduction to some of the autumn, flower, autumn flowering bulbs that can be found here. I hope it emphasises the importance of the Peloponnese as a biodiversity hotspot. It also has stunning scenery and a deep cultural history that collectively make it as such a very special place. Uh, my special thanks must also go to Dr Christopher Gray Wilson, who led the trips in the Octobers of 2000 and 2001 that are summarised here. Any errors in the preceding, of course, are of my own invention. Thank you.